Hello, everyone, and welcome to the global launch of Outbreak Ready, a digital readiness and response simulation brought to you by the Ready Initiative. During this webinar, we encourage you to ask questions as we go using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Access to today's recording will be available after the session on the Ready website. It's now my pleasure to turn it over to Laura Cardinal, Ready's Chief of Party. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, as Laura said, my name is Laura Cardinal and I am the Chief of Party of the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance funded Ready Initiative. Um, just making sure that we're all here today for the same reason. Um, we're really excited to be able to introduce to you a new digital simulation tool called Outbreak Ready. Um, it was developed with the support of BHA and Outbreak Ready is an innovative online outbreak simulation. And today we're gonna talk you through how we developed it, how you can use it, show you a sneak peek to um, get you excited and show you some of the tools that are available for you and your organization as you utilize the simulation. Before we get started, I wanted to take a quick moment to introduce you to our speakers. So um, as I say your name, if you can give a wave so that the participants know who you are, that would be great. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Paul Spiegel, the director of the John Hopkins Center for Humanitarian Health. I would also like to introduce Hannah, Hannah Hamrick, the senior project manager for the Center for Humanitarian Health. Ailey Higgins, the Monitoring and Evaluation Advisor for the Ready Initiative, and Ibrahim Ismail, the Health Coordinator for Premier Urgence International in Sudan, who will be joining us a little bit later um, in the hour. I'm going to hand it over to Paul in a moment to say a few words, but first I wanted to ask you all um, a couple of questions. So we're going to have a quick poll, and I wanted to ask how many of you have participated in an in-person simulation, whether it's for humanitarian work or outbreak or, or some other work in your uh, work? It's great seeing this poll in real time. <laughs> All oh, great. So it seems like most of you have participated in some sort of in-person simulation as a learning tool for your professional or organizational development, about 63%. So that's great. And then the second question is, how many of you have used a digital game as a learning or a training tool? Oh, this is interesting. I thought um, I thought it would be more lopsided, to be honest. So it's great to see that we have about 50-50, and we are really excited um, within Ready to bring together all of the good um, learnings that you can get from a simulation into a digital space and a digital tool. So um, I'll hand over now to Paul just to say a few words. Paul, go ahead. I, excuse me. Hi, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to see so many people, some friends and colleagues, and, and some from um, all over the world. So we're very excited to um, to present this to you. And I will be brief and just to say that this has been um, a dream of mine for about 20 years um, in order to try to work on a tool where you could work either separately online and or with people to learn so that so many people would be able to be trained um, uh, trained in, in this manner. And I'm just so happy that uh, Ready and USAID um, have been able to allow us to do this. So we're really excited to get your feedback. Thank you and, and back to you, Laura. Great, thanks so much. And before I hand it over to Hannah to walk you through and introduce you to Outbreak Ready, just a quick um, note on the Ready Initiative. So Ready is a BHA funded consortium of partners that's led by Save the Children in partnership with the John Hopkins Center for Humanitarian Health, the John Hopkins Center for Communication Programs, UK Med, Mercy Malaysia, and EcoHealth Alliance. 
And the aim of the Ready Initiative is to augment what already exists and to support the capacity of NGOs to be ready to respond to major infectious disease outbreaks in humanitarian settings. And we typically work across three primary areas. The first is to strengthen NGO understanding and engagement in the outbreak response coordination architecture. The second is to support NGOs in their operational readiness to be able to respond to major infectious disease outbreaks. And the third is to support the adaptation, development, and dissemination of technical tools and guidance to support um, readiness and response. And we are really excited to say that READY will be continuing for another two years. Um, and that this simulation is the first of two simulations we'll be developing over the next period. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Hannah, for an introduction to Outbreak Ready. Thank you, Laura. Um, first, I will give a brief overview of the simulation. So what it is, why it was developed, and who we are primarily targeting. And I will show you some previews of the simulation uh, throughout the discussion. So I'd like to begin with a more detailed overview of what Outbreak Ready is. It is a capacity building simulation that uses gaming technology as the tool. Uh, the simulation is structured as a branching narrative game. So as the learner is moving through the narrative, they're making choices that impact how the actual events unfold. And the overall scenario depicts an outbreak within a humanitarian setting, and it focuses, it focuses both on readiness and response elements for a major disease outbreak. The learner in the sim takes the perspective of a team lead of a multi-sectoral NGO, aptly called Ready, and throughout the simulation, the team lead is making strategic decisions that determine how the NGO adapts and, their, and expands their programming in response to the outbreak. So it allows the learner to be exposed to the pace, the stressors, the various stakeholders, and ultimately they engage in key decisions and trade-offs that are involved throughout the different stages of an outbreak response. Uh, the simulation takes approximately two to two and a half hours to play, and it takes you through seven turns each turn depicting one day over multiple months in the life of a response. And one key thing to mention is that Outbreak Ready at its core is not a game. The focus is not on the gamification of the content. Um, so for example, you cannot win or lose the simulation. Um, Outbreak Ready is a simulation and it focuses on the learning experience for the player. So it includes elements of everything you would see in an in-person simulation. So for example, there are multiple characters and scenes and time pressure and decision-making with very limited information and trade-offs that the team lead is having to make. So the primary aim is for this to be a robust learning opportunity for players, but also to be engaging and interesting and fun. Um, some examples of how Outbreak Ready can be used. Um, we see this as a professional development tool for you or someone in your organization who's interested in learning more about Outbreak in a humanitarian context. Um, it could be an opportunity to enhance or refresh um, your readiness and response skills, or it could be used as a kickoff uh, for a training or for an annual emergency preparedness or outbreak preparedness planning session. Thus far, the simulation has been used for individual play. It's been facilitated for a group uh, in an NGO setting. Um, and we've also talked with universities who are using or are planning to use it as part of their humanitarian curriculum. So before moving on any further in the overview, I think it would be helpful to show you the, introdu the introductory video for the simulation. So this is included at the beginning of Outbreak Ready, and it provides learners with the necessary context to begin playing. So I will go ahead and play that for you now. This land is a low-income country with a population of 18 million. Despite its human and natural resources, 
the country struggles with many challenges, including a lack of infrastructure, economic hardship and weak governance, all of which inhibit development efforts. 13 months ago, disputed elections led to conflict and the internal displacement of 280,000 of this land's people. Although violence has declined sharply since the formation of a new government five months ago, the country's situation remains volatile. Responding to the displacement, Reddy established an NGO sub-office in the city of Murel, in the northeast of the country. Reddy operates programs in three informal IDP settlements and within the urban area of Murel, with a focus on primary health care, nutrition, food and livelihoods assistance, and clean water and sanitation. You have been team lead for the emergency response for a few months. And together with the Ready team and national partners, you have been working to provide critical support to thousands of displaced families and members of the horse community. Today starts like any other day at the office, but the life of a team lead never goes as planned. Okay, so that was to give you just a, a sneak preview. We'll do, uh, we'll look more at the simulation in a few minutes. Um, but I want to move now into just a brief overview of why Outbreak Ready was developed. So it was originally intended to be an in-person simulation, but due to COVID-19, transitioned to an online sim to respond to the necessary public health measures that were put in place. Um, but it also allowed Ready the opportunity to utilize an innovative pedagogical tool. And one really important feature of this type of digital simulation is that Outbreak Ready and all of the accompanying tools are available for free for anyone who's interested on the Ready website. Um, and this allows the training to reach a much broader global audience. Um, it was also developed for low bandwidth context. So it is able to be used by teams working in humanitarian settings at both the national and subnational levels, which was a key consideration during the development process as well. So who is Outbreak Ready for? The simulation is designed for national and international NGOs responding to humanitarian emergencies, both for those who are currently responding to outbreaks or intending to respond to outbreaks in humanitarian settings. Uh, we're particularly targeting NGO leaders and managers from both operational and programmatic backgrounds across all sectors. So while Outbreak Ready was designed primarily to support NGO readiness, readiness and response, um, we think that all humanitarian actors can also benefit. Um, it's also applicable for humanitarian adjacent actors, for national ministries, and for students, uh, both those in the health sector and for those interested in working more generally within humanitarian contexts. So the goal of the simulation is for the learner to become more confident in their ability to make data-driven and community-centered strategic decisions in an outbreak response. And it also focuses on helping the player to understand the important relationship between programmatic and operational readiness actions with actual response outcomes. So that's something that we've built into the simulation, the reality and consequences for how choices you make in the preparedness and readiness phase impact the actual response. So there are four primary learning objectives for the simulation. They center around operational readiness, coordination with key stakeholders, sectoral integration, and triangulating the epidemiological assessment and community feedback data in order to adaptively manage in an outbreak. And this last one is key as it highlights the variety of information sources, often contradictory, that a team lead receives and has to piece together in an outbreak response context. Um, so that's something you see within the simulation. Um, the team lead is having to sift through information from many different data sources. They receive news reports and internal sit reps, uh, an NGO clinic data report, and they receive you know, sit reps from the health working group, et cetera, plus all of the interactions they have with different 
um, members of their team, the different uh, program managers and the operations manager. They meet with the Ministry of Health representative and a representative from the, the IDP community. So the learner is having to sift through all of these different information sources, some of which are contradictory, in order to understand the context and to make the right decision um, in the response. So the key decision moments that we've built throughout the SIM, they relate back to these primary learning objectives. So briefly, we'll look at how Outbreak Ready was developed. We started the process in January of 2021, um, we, and then we began building the simulation in April. So it's taken one full year to develop. Um, we consulted with over 100 interagency subject matter experts throughout the development period. Um, and in the beginning, we worked with over 30 SMEs for sectoral specific inputs and inputs on cross-cutting themes, including RCCE and child protection, for example. So this group of people was involved from the outset of the development. They were involved in creating the learning objectives, the target audience, and building out the specific characteristics of this fictitious humanitarian context. And then they worked with us throughout the drafting of the narrative content. Um, we also worked with colleagues at Johns Hopkins and Save the Children to draft a novel pathogen um, and to develop the epi model that is the backdrop for the outbreak scenario in the narrative. And I won't speak more on that so as not to give it away. Um, it was certainly a unique project of world building as we piece together every element of the broader narrative scenario. Um, we also worked with a small group of subject matter experts, um, each who had experience working as team leads in humanitarian context, because one goal we had was to have a high degree of fidelity in how we depicted the daily life of the team lead. Um, and this was the starting point for developing the actual user interface, which you'll see in just a moment. Um, we worked with the developer to consider how does a team lead gather information and make decisions during a response? Who are the stakeholders that they're engaging with? What are the key dilemmas and decision points that they're faced with? And very importantly, um, what are some of the key pitfalls and mistakes that occur in a humanitarian response and how could we incorporate those decision points uh, throughout the simulation. So we also worked with a larger group of over 75 people from different organizations and backgrounds. So these individuals were humanitarian professionals at the HQ regional and national level. There were serious gaming experts, um, professional war gamers, uh, also members of the Ready Advisory Group and representatives from donor agencies. We worked with them at multiple stages during the development process and they helped us to test and refine and validate the product and the content. So finally, a key piece uh, and the last piece of the development process were pilot events that Ready facilitated to test the facilitation manuals, which you'll hear more about later. Um, we did five events, four in person and one virtually. Um, and these were really critical in collecting feedback from our target audience that we were able to incorporate into the final build. So needless to say, we're very pleased to be at this stage of the full launch of the simulation and the corresponding tools. So now I'd like to move into a brief demo of the simulation. I will be giving you a sneak peek um, only in turn one in order to not give too much of the narrative away. So you see on the screen here that each turn, it begins with a briefing that situates the player in the time and what's taking place in the broader scenario. It also outlines the key you know, events and objectives that you have for the turn. So for example, here in turn one, you learn that there's not been significant violence uh, where Ready is operating in the recent days um, and that you have kind of a standard day in the office where you'll be having two meetings. So then we move into the overview of the simulation. And this is kind of the overview with, of the structure and some instructions on how to play the game. 
And then here you have an overview of your workspace and the main features that are a part of the workspace. So jumping in here to turn one, you see that you have four minutes until your next appointment, which is your weekly meeting with the health and nutrition manager. And then you have your agenda, which gives you an overview of your day. So you have time to work on your to-do list items. And then you have these two meetings, as I mentioned. You have your to-do list here, which is empty at this moment because we're giving time to read the background documents, but throughout the simulation, this populates with a lot of to-do items throughout the day. And we have this, and I'm sure you can hear that you're receiving text messages, which we'll get through, get to in a moment. Um, but you have this note to get some coffee. So um, as those of us who've worked in humanitarian responses before are aware, you can never have enough coffee. And so here you have a coffee corner, which is where the team lead can go to hear staff just having informal conversations. Um, and, and throughout the simulation, this populates with different information. And it's actually where we've placed some important contextual pieces of information as a way just to highlight the importance of a team lead who's communicating with their staff in both informal and formal ways. So going back to your home screen. Here you have your emails and your files. So we'll look first at your file folder. We have here background information on the country of this land where you're working. You have the map, which you saw in the introductory video. You have a country brief, which gives an overview of the history and the context where you're working. You also have a humanitarian response strategy. Um, and then here we have background information on your NGO. So you have your organization chart um, with the different members of your team. You're the team lead uh, here and you report to the country director, Afreen, who we'll hear from in just a minute. And these are the different program managers um, and operations manager that report to you and who you're interacting with throughout the simulation. And then lastly here, you have your humanitarian program portfolio. So this is an overview of Ready, the organization on the global and national level. And you also have kind of an, an outline of the different sectors that Ready is working in. So they operate in health and nutrition and food security and livelihoods, as well as WASH. So you can read that in detail to find out more information about the programs that you're managing. So then jumping out here, we will look at the chat messages that you were hearing come through. You are able to mute the game because throughout the simulation, there's so many emails and text messages that are coming through. So you are able to mute. Um, but this chat message is from the Ready CD in the neighboring country of Neighborland, uh, who's called Cecile. And she is letting you know that she was at a health coordination group meeting in Neighborland yesterday. And there are NGOs reporting a possible disease outbreak of some sort of influenza-like illness in the Northwest region. So she's saying there's nothing confirmed. It could be seasonal flu, but I will keep you updated if I hear anything else. And then going here to our emails, this is from Afreen, who I mentioned is the country director for this land, who the team lead reports to. And she is saying that uh, she's received this email from Cecile and she's asking you to reach out to colleagues in the Ministry of Health and in the different sector working groups to find out more information about this possible disease outbreak. So, and then here you see that you have a countdown clock as you will be pushed into your next meeting with the health and nutrition program manager. Um, so I, I don't wanna give too much away, so I'll pause there, but just a few other comments on how the simulation works. Um, so throughout each turn, the learner, the team lead, is having interactions such as this one with the health program manager. Um, they meet with many different characters in order to gather information and to make smaller decisions and then to make a final larger decision at the end of each turn. 
So they are going to meet with ready staff members, representatives from the Ministry of Health um, and the IDP community and a national NGO partner organization. Um, they also attend a health coordination meeting with other NGO stakeholders along the way. And the inputs that they receive throughout these interactions, they inform the decisions that they encounter throughout the simulation. Um, one key thing to know is that throughout the simulation, there are consequences for decisions made. So, for example, if the learner fails to appropriately interact with the Ministry of Health official, then the official is angry at them at a subsequent coordination meeting in a later turn, and she's resistant to their program expansion plans. Um, and, and then in addition to the in narrative consequences for decisions made, there are also six evaluation categories on which the learner is being scored as they're playing. And at the end of the simulation, they receive what we call a real-time review. And that has feedback specifically tailored to the choices that the player made within these categories. All right, so jumping back to um, okay, jumping back to the PowerPoint, um, here we have just a brief, um, I mentioned briefly the pilot events that we ran. We conducted three in-person facilitated events with NGOs in Cameroon, Turkey, and with the PUI team in Sudan. And as I said, these were really key in gathering feedback to inform the final, um, the final product. So we made final revisions and then um, finalized the simulation just last week. So we were very happy to have Ibrahim Ismail on the call with us today. Um, I'm not sure, I know he was at a coordination meeting in Khartoum. So Ibrahim, were you able to join us? Uh, Hannah, I have seen him come on and offline a few times. So I think maybe he's having some internet connection issues in Sudan. Okay, thanks, Laura. Um, so what we'll do is I'll go ahead, we'll, we'll pause with Ibrahim and if he's able to join, then we will definitely hear from him towards the end. But I will go ahead and hand over to my colleague, Ailey, who is going to give an overview of the facilitation tools that we've developed to utilize with the simulation. Thanks, Hannah. So to help individuals and organizations get the most out of Outbreak Ready, we've developed um, three accompanying facilitation tools. First, we have two manuals um, for group facilitation. One is for in-person events and the other is for um, virtual events. And we've been piloting them um, at the various um, trainings we've been doing over the past few months. So each of the manuals um, includes some guidance on how you could facilitate a web-based simulation for a group it gives you some guidance on the timings um, and kind of how to guide players through it and troubleshoot any issues they have. We've also provided um, facilitation, uh, like a facilitation, facilitated group discussion guide that has some questions to help talk through key decisions that the players will make in the simulation and how to apply those decisions to your own context and work. Um, there's also additional materials in there for the facilitator that gives some background on um, the optimal and less optimal options for the decisions, what the kind of key information is to help you make those decisions, and some of the rationale that went into the design of Outbreak Ready, um, just so you can have some more fruitful conversations about that. So in addition to our um, manuals for group play, we also have a solo play guide, um, which is targeted for people who are playing individually. This includes reflection questions um, to guide players through key learning moments throughout the simulation. And all three of these resources are available on the Ready Initiative website and they are free and open for all to use. If you're considering facilitating Outbreak Ready for your team or organization, there's contact information on the website and you're welcome to reach out to us with any questions. We're also really excited to announce that um, in April we will have the simulation, and then all three of these tools available in both French and Spanish, and those will be found on the Ready website. I think we're still waiting for Ibrahim, so do we want to go to the Q&A, Laura? There he is. Oh, perfect timing. <laughs> Hannah, do you want to introduce Ibrahim? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for joining Ibrahim. 
Um, so as Laura mentioned previously, uh, Ibrahim is the health coordinator for Premier en Chance in Sudan. Um, and he was one of the members of the PUI team that attended the training in Khartoum last month. So he participated in the Outbreak Ready simulation. Um, Ibrahim has over five years of experience in the humanitarian sector in Iraq, Nigeria, Yemen, and Sudan. And so we really appreciate him joining um, towards the end of his day today. So we've asked Ibrahim to talk briefly about his experience playing Outbreak Ready and how it applies to his role at PUI as the help coordinator. As the help coordinator. Um, and then we've also asked him just to talk briefly about how Outbreak Ready was helpful for PUI to be better prepared for future outbreaks in Sudan. So Ibrahim, I will hand it over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Hannah and everyone on the, on the panel. And uh, sincere apologies for arriving late. I just pulled myself out from the, from the another meeting. Um, yes. Uh, for, for, for the question about Outbreak Ready and then kind of our experience, I will talk um, on maybe on behalf, on my behalf and then the, the people who actually joined us as well in the, in the training or around uh, 14 people. Um, I think Outbreak Ready is, is, is an exact translation of, of reality. It's like what we usually de do on a day-to-day on -day basis. <clears throat> It's like focused on the on the outbreak preparedness, and it kind of gives this taste of what we might go through when we when, when we make decisions, whether basically it's about outbreak or, or any kind of decisions of preparedness, basically. Um, because usually, when 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 we make these decisions, sometimes for things that are not happening yet, maybe we don't focus on it that much. Maybe we don't concentrate, or maybe we don't give that. Uh, let's say that importance to these decisions. But I think when playing the game, you kind of experience this firsthand that every decision you make, every um, conversation you have with someone, it always feeds into, into kind of the overall um, preparedness, like how you, how you uh, will make decisions in the, in the future. <clears throat> um, I think, well, everyone enjoyed playing the game. It was a bit stressful but it was like actual reflection of, of reality and great uh, teaching methodology. I even talked to a few of our colleagues about like some parts of the, of the, of the simulation and we kind of had the same reactions, like uh, being under pressure at some point, being annoyed with someone or being like happy about someone doing something. So it's basically like what we actually usually do. And I think, as, I think as a health coordinator at, at capital level, so, um, we're responsible kind of for the medical strategy for the, for the mission. And I think one of the important uh, aspects is the outbreak preparedness. And I think something that we're planning to do and we already kind of started to do in our mission in, in Sudan. I think this, this uh, outbreak ready is an important tool to kind of kickstart what we're planning and acting to do. Um, because while, while, uh, while playing the game and discussing afterwards, etc., it kind of gives us the, like, how we actually should uh, kind of manage this thing. Um, so, so, so basically, I think it's, it's a great tool to kind of start the planning and action as well, not only the planning. And um, I think it will be really uh, good tools for us for, for outbreak preparedness in, uh, in Sudan. I think you mentioned something about being translated to Spanish and uh, I think another language. I don't know if it, it will be translated to Arabic. Uh, a lot of our teams loved it in the capital level and we're thinking of like if we can do it even at, at a field level. Uh, so maybe English will not be the, the first language. Um, well, in general, I'd like to thank the people who were actually there while we, we, we did the simulation uh, from, the, from the ready team. And it was nice to meet you all there and hopefully to, to meet soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ibrahim. We really appreciate your time and you sharing some of your experiences with playing uh, with your team in Khartoum. So it was a pleasure being there with you as well. Um, now I will hand it over to Laura for the question and answer session. 
Great, thanks so much. Um, I'll start with Ibrahim's question about whether or not Outbreak Ready will be translated into Arabic. So we are, we started with French and Spanish as that are, those are the languages that are most requested um, from Ready when we're doing some of our events and trainings. But we're hoping with additional funding as we move into the next phase of Ready that if there is um, requests and demand for other languages that we could look into other languages as well. So thanks for making the plug for Arabic, Ibrahim, we appreciate that. Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat, so I'll just take them one by one. The first one, um, Paul, if you're still there, I think I'll throw this question to you. And the question is, what is the disease used in the simulation and, and maybe why, why did we choose this disease uh, without giving too much away? <laughs> sure. it's, a, um, it's a variant of an influenza. And um, the reason we chose that was we, we didn't obviously want to do COVID. We decided to have a similar type of transmission, meaning respiratory. And um, before COVID, the chances of, and we've been talking about some sort of massive influenza in epidemic or pandemic since 1918. And so it's still also highly likely that something like this could occur. So that's why uh, we decided to choose that one. Great, thanks so much. Um, and then the next question is, I think Hannah, I'll hand this one over to you. Um, can you give an example of one or two of the decisions the player has to make throughout the simulation? Yes, absolutely. So, um, and this is, uh, again, I'm trying not to give too much away, but so for example, the team lead is having to choose how as the outbreak is is spreading and they're gathering information from different sources. They're having to choose how and when to adapt the existing programs that they have. Um, so whether or not they keep things moving forward at the status quo um, or how they choose to, to shift the programs and how they're implementing. So do they continue with general food distribution or do they shift to cash voucher, for example? Um, there are other decision points um, that relate to their NGO partner. So they're coordinating with a national NGO partner to do um, community health worker programming. And so as the outbreak is beginning to spread, they're choosing how and when to expand that community health worker program. And they're choosing whether or not to engage, for example, in surveillance activities at the request of the Ministry of Health. So it's a lot of decisions around both the operational and programmatic side of things as they both adapt and then ultimately expand their programming. Great, thanks Hannah. Um, there's a question in the chat about whether or not the game is pausable um, because of the time commitment to complete it. Is it possible to do it in sections, pause it and come back to it? Um, Ailey, do you wanna take that one? Thanks, Laura. So in the actual game, um, if you go to the coffee corner, it does pause the time. So if you need to step away for a few minutes, that does pause play time. Um, if you do wanna break it up into turns, your progress is saved at the end of every turn. So if you've completed through turn three and then you log back in later, you will be where you left off um, at the end of turn three, start of turn four. Yes, great. And we've had some feedback from um, players at John Hopkins University and McGill University that have piloted and used the simulation already in their classroom of some different approaches to that as well. So one professor at McGill University was having their students play through the first three turns or the first three days of the simulation, um, come to the class ready to talk about that, and then they played through the rest of the simulation during the class time. We're exploring with a few other universities using the simulation in their humanitarian certificate programs, and we're brainstorming with them different ways to break up the simulation for class time. And so if you're interested in that, please do reach out to us, and we're happy to brainstorm with you how, how this could be best used in a classroom setting. 
Um, another question is around access and who can play and what is needed in terms of registering or identification to play the game. And Hannah, I'll hand that over to you. Okay, um, thanks, Laura. We are very happy to say that Outbreak Ready and all of the accompanying facilitation tools are available for free to anyone on the Ready website. So maybe Laura, if you could post the link to the Ready website in the chat, um, but the current English versions and then when the French and Spanish are available in April, all of which will be open access on the Ready website. And then later they will also be available on the Kaya platform as well. Great, thanks. Um, Hannah, I'll give you this one too, because I think you managed a lot of the engagement with the um, subject matter experts, both internally and externally to the Ready Initiative. Um, I'm so impressed by how thoughtful and collaborative the process was for developing this. How did you balance broad engagement and feedback while also moving the project forward over a relatively short timeline? I would admit that this was the most challenging piece of the project. Um, I think, to be honest, we had a, um, the 30 SMEs that were involved in more detail in the project. They were an incredible group of people, and we really just communicated uh, very frequently the timeline and the limited amounts of time we had when product was due to the developer and range. And they did an excellent job of working with us to maintain those tight turnarounds. I think um, one way that we tried to manage that challenge was we had sessions in the beginning with the SMEs where we did kind of broad blue sky thinking and a lot of input into the initial stages. And then the core team would go away and draft, draft content, draft the ideas and present it back to that group. And it allowed them to give kind of specific tailored feedback um, that we needed at the different stages. And we did the same thing for narrative drafting. So we actually did most of the, the writing and then the SMEs came in um, and filled in a lot of just rich information based on their sectoral or cross-cutting theme focus. Um, so that was one of the ways we tried to mitigate that challenge was to keep the drafting with a smaller group of people, but with a lot of inputs coming into the content. So I don't know if Ailey has anything to add on that front. That was her and I's significant challenge over the last year. <laughs> and it was definitely a learning process as we went through kind of merging humanitarian ways of working with game developer ways of working. Um, definitely lessons learned. And if people are thinking about developing a game like this, um, we are happy to give you guys some of our lessons learned on that. And I would just add in quickly, we worked with a game development studio called Anne Range, and they were excellent to collaborate with throughout this process. And they worked really hard to understand the humanitarian setting. And we worked really hard to understand uh, the agile world of gaming development. And so it was very collaborative in our relationship and communication with them as well. Oh. Does the sim include health and nutrition only or other sectors? So we definitely wanted this to be a multi-sectoral response. Um, when we think about the Ready Initiative, we think about community-centered, multi-sectoral response to infectious disease outbreaks. And we wanted that to be represented in Outbreak Ready. So some of the, the sectors that are included are health, nutrition, WASH, food security and livelihoods with some elements of child protection as well. We wanted to include even much more, but the, you know, the time and scope of the project didn't allow for that. And then there are cross-cutting themes of gender and risk communication and community engagement throughout. Um, David, from you is, um, you're curious if the sim covers outbreaks of unknown origin and multi-sectoral disciplinary disease investigations, for example, One Health. So there are some 
nods to um, zoonotic disease and one health elements throughout the simulation. Um, Eco Health Alliance is a key partner under the Ready Initiative. And so bringing in that one health approach to the work that we do is really important. Um, but it, we don't go that in depth um, on that approach in this simulation. Um, but we do have um, one thing I forgot to mention at the beginning of the webinar is that we have just been approved for a two-year extension of the Ready Initiative, which we're so excited about. So that will take us, um, that will start April 1st. And within that, we've received funding to build another digital simulation. So um, we're not quite sure yet if, it, if our ready team will continue on to a new outbreak or further explore this outbreak. Um, we're still kind of in the visioning stage. But um, we will definitely be having a more technical approach. So while this one really focused on leadership and decision making, the next simulation we anticipate to have a more health technical and um, community engagement RCCE focus and bringing in those One Health and other cross-cutting elements. Um, uh, I see a question for Ibrahim, actually. Oh, great. Um, Ibrahim, the question is, can you speak to some of the specific decisions that you made in the simulation and how it relates to your experience, either in Sudan or elsewhere, um, and your context? Uh, yes, I think this is an excellent question because one of the events during the, the game is actually reflected like really in, in reality. So there was like this decision that uh, we had to make with uh, with the local authority, so basically uh, Ministry of Health or, or some sort of authority, that uh, us as an organization or as an individual playing, we kind of refused some offer or like some request basically, and then during this you kind of see the the face changing and the reaction of the of the person that you're talking to or in the meeting to uh, changes. And then you even hear from like your boss or like from your colleagues that like, hey, like that local authority is kind of upset with you. So what have you done? And then for this thing is that you see your decisions like, okay, it has kind of repercussions, but then moving along the way, you would know actually, even if that decision was correct or wrong, or would say it's like, was it favorable or, or not favorable? Because by the end, maybe refusing some requests uh, is the best decision to do because of, I don't know, um, like low, low funding or like non-availability of resources, basically. So trying to prioritize. So basically you, you kind of go through this within, uh, within the simulation, but I think you, you would understand by the end of the simulation that if what you did was, was the best thing to do or just like, okay. Thanks, Ibrahim. Great. Uh, Paul, I don't know, do you have anything that you want to add about our initial vision for Outbreak Ready and the, the process of developing it and, and how we got to where we are today <laughs> with the product? <laughs> yeah. um, I'm still not entirely sure how we did get where we are, but um, the I think we, those of us that didn't know, like myself, all the details of gaming, and I still do not, um, I think I expected something more like a Hollywood movie um, that we could do in terms of the complexity. And it, it was a bit of reality to really work and bring it back to bare bones, specifically, what do we want people to learn? And then what would be some of the key turns in the, uh, that Hannah's been talking about to make that happen? Um, so it was... I still think it's very, very engaging the way we've done it, but you know, there aren't motion pictures and, and um, sounds in the same way I think I originally thought, which would have been probably a hundred million, I don't know, a lot of money, uh, not a hundred million, but millions and millions to actually do something like this. And probably as many people have said, takes away from the experience a bit because you get more involved in the other components and perhaps not the game itself. And I guess the other thing that, um, we learned is I is that you 
we had to choose certain areas. We, we couldn't go too broad, such as doing coordination, technical, admin. So we, we really had to choose certain areas and each turn you do, if it builds upon the others, it gets very, um, it gets very complicated in terms of all of the um, areas that we need to go to. So we had to keep it simpler perhaps than I had originally envisaged, which is why I think we're also happy that we'll be doing another one in, in Ready2, which will have a, a more community and technical focus um, to allow us to do certain, concentrate on certain areas that we were not able to do in this one. Over. Great, thanks, Paul. Um, there is a question about um, for the decisions under the simulation, are there reference point for these decisions? How does one know whether they are making a reasonable decision or should they think of cha changing that decision next time? So I, I think I can take that to start and then maybe hand over to you, Hannah, if you have something to add on that. So first, most of the feedback that you receive during the simulation is diegetic feedback, um, meaning that you know, the, you're getting those responses Paul's laughing because we both just learned that word recently, um, <laughs> where you get the feedback in the simulation, either from how someone responds to you, their body language, um, how the narrative branches out to different scenarios based on the decisions that you've made throughout the game. And so that feedback is meant to keep you in the world and in the simulation. The only time that you have feedback outside of the simulation is at the end of the game, where you receive something called a real-time review. And the idea is that a team has come in to review um, your performance and your team's performance on the response. And as Hannah was saying, there's no win or lose, um, but there is a feedback at the end of the simulation that talks you through some of the key categories um, related to the learning objectives and gives you some feedback on how well you did in certain key areas. In the um, facilitation manual, there is a more detailed decision matrix that goes through the specific decisions in each turn or each day of the simulation, what the optimal or suboptimal answers are and why, so that you can facilitate a more detailed discussion with your team. And I will say that we debated some of these even within the design team. And I think that we all know as humanitarians and as responders that as a team leader, you're making decisions with little information, sometimes incomplete information and with um, time pressures. And so there's not necessarily a right or wrong in all situations, just maybe a, a, a better path or a less suboptimal path. Um, does, do any of the presenters want to add to that? That was very comprehensive, Laura. I have nothing to add. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hannah, there is a question to you. Can, the, can this be played by a team of, let's say, six students, or do all the players see the same storyline? Yeah, so it's definitely possible to play with groups of students, um, but it would be each player. Well, and actually, you could potentially have people play in teams. That's something that I actually want to do next in one of our facilitations is to have people play in pairs of two. Um, but uh, each person is playing kind of one narrative. So if you had all of the different, if you had everyone play six different, on six different computers, they would have six different experiences with the sim, though, though overall the narrative would flow in the same way. So I think um, both as teams or as individuals are both ways you can play. Great. There was another question in the chat about whether or not this could be shared um, and if it was openly accessible to everyone. Um, and so I think that's a great way to end the webinar today. It's just to say that Outbreak Ready is live on the Ready Initiative website right now. Um, please do share widely with your 
friends and colleagues, supervisors, it is open for everyone to use. Um, as Ailey was saying earlier, in the next few weeks, we will also have links to a French and Spanish version of the simulation that can be played from the um, Outbreak Ready or from the Ready Initiative website. In the coming months, it will also be available on the Kaya platform through the Humanitarian Leadership Academy, who is one of our great partners under the next phase of Ready. Um, and it I think Han Hannah said this earlier, but Outbreak Ready has been specifically designed to be used in low bandwidth settings. So take a few moments to download it onto your laptop and once it loads, it should be ready to play. There are a few um, troubleshooting questions on the website and um, contact to reach out to us if you have any trouble downloading or playing the game, either as an individual or in a group setting. And I just want to say thank you so much for joining the webinar today. We really appreciate it. We'll be doing another launch event like this at 10 Eastern tonight for the Asia and Australia time zone. So please do forward the invite to any of your colleagues in those locations that you think might be interested or any um, night owls uh, in the Eastern time zone <laughs> that might wanna hear more about Outbreak Ready. Please don't hesitate to reach out um, to the Ready Initiative with any questions. And I just wanna give a huge thanks to um, Paul and Hannah and the Center for Humanitarian Health for their leadership on the development of Outbreak Ready and to all of the subject matter experts, both within um, Save the Children and external to Save the Children um, for their support in its development and to Anne Range as well. So thanks everybody so much for joining and please go play Outbreak Ready. <laughs>